Good morning, everybody. Good morning, <laughs> Dick. Okay, so welcome to the second session of OAuth. Uh, we have 90 minutes, so uh, we, we don't have the full two and a half hours, only the first uh, 90 minutes. Um, so this is the note well. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, Make sure to look at it. Uh, everything you say and, and contribute is still under that you know well. Uh, thanks to uh, Dan uh, for being our Jabber scribe and uh, for Tony for uh, voluntold to <laughs> to be a, <laughs> a minute taker and. And here are blue shoots. Oh, blue shoots. <laughs> blue sheets will be. And here's our schedule for the day. So, <clears throat> uh, Hannes will start uh, uh, talking about uh, POP tokens. He has uh, 15 minutes to do that. Uh, then uh, Dick will talk about uh, distributed OAuth, and uh, at the end, John will talk about uh, uh, security BCP. Any bash for this agenda? Any comment about this? Okay, let's get going. Test, test. So we'll yeah. see what it takes 50 minutes to discuss this. Uh, may take two hours. Uh, there. Well, let's see. We'll drive. Okay. Um, that's what, so who of you doesn't remember the, the pop token work? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, who does not? You guys remember, right? Okay, but I will very briefly go through this um, so that the story was, and you see that uh, sort of manifested in, in the different documents is that, and particularly also in the ace OR. so it's a little bit of an ace OAS uh, high level introduction, if you will, um, see it that way then. Um, so they, we had these two diff slightly different patterns um, for symmetric versus asymmetric keys. Um, with the start with the symmetric key version first. Uh, when the client talks to the authorization server to get the access and the refresh token, it um, it made that request and indicated that it wants. Um, oh, I should point over here. It wants uh, um, a symmetric key version and. There are a few parameters that are passed along, which I will describe in, in subsequent slides. But the important part is that the token comes back, a POP token comes back, and um, along with it, keys that are sent from the authorization server to the client for use by the client. The access token itself also has keys. It's a POP token, after all. Uh, but those are uh, in sort of like... Um, they are, so this, this is the usual POP token, so it's actually consumed only by the resource server, but in the symmetric key solution, the symmetric key has to be sort of uh, carried encrypted in that payload. And we have the data structures defined for doing so. In the in OAS, we had all this, the, the work with the JSON web token, and then the corresponding POP token extension has been uh, long done and we are about to finish, so if you attended the ACE session this week, 
you saw the discussion about finishing the Bob token extension for the CWD, the, the CBOR web token. Okay. Brian? Um, the asymmetric version is a little, uh, slightly different because the client doesn't need to have the authorization server generate the public private key pair, but instead um, it just, the client just tells the authorization server what uh, public key to include in the, in the POP token. And that's um, uh, described here and we use the same um, mechanisms for doing so. And there's, um, uh, the access token in this case just contains the, the public key or fingerprint of it and there's nothing that needs to be sent uh, back from the authorization server to the client because the client already has the uh, public and private key. Okay, and then um, of course uh, then the client when it talks to the resource server it has to use the POP token and demonstrate possession of the and the key, and it does this in a variety of different ways, and specifically in, in the work done in ACE, there are different ways uh, defined to tie it to a specific security protocol. There's a, a DTLS-based version, there's a, a OSCOR version, and so on and so on. Um, okay. So unless, um, uh, in comparison to OAuth, where we had this struggle, uh, with the HTTP signing in the core working group, people came up with this, um, the OSCore mechanism to protect uh, various headers and payloads uh, you know, for, for co-op. And they also, we had that pre presentation a few ITFs ago, um, that group also believed that they have come up with a solution for HTTP. But uh, that's a, a separate topic that I don't want to go through here now. So what's the status of this, of all of this? Um, so in, in the ACE OR specification, there's a, there's a framework document um, which builds on, on OAuth as the name indicates and it uses, it uses the POP token functionality only, it doesn't use bear tokens. And it also has um, this, or points to the CWD in, instead of the JWD for efficiency reason. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, there are also other protocols used than HTTP. We have also worked on other protocols in OAS on other than HTTP. If you remember the, the SASL uh, GSAP, GSS API for email, uh, that was a little longer ago. It was actually, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't done in OAS, but done under the uh, supervision of uh, OAS. Um, um, in any case, um, in one of the use, so there are different use cases and there's a longer use case document uh, available in ACE that uh, tells what you uh, could use the whole framework for. But one of the use cases is where the client, um, for example, is a smartphone or tablet that talks to an IoT device uh, to, and to control it, to configure it and to do something. and the client, the OAuth client, uses HTTP uh, to talk to the authorization server, just a regular OAuth authorization server that supports POP token usage. And instead of, um, since the authorization server can issue tokens with different types, it can, in this case, uh, for performance reasons, can issue CWD POP tokens. Um, but then as the client gets all this stuff, it passes it on to the IoT device, for example, using co-op or some of the other IoT related protocols like MQTT. And so the current status is that in that document, which is um, going to end the working group last call fairly soon, in uh, I think Jim said in September, um, it defines parameters for that exchange with the Bob tokens. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the parameters in a second. Um, it defines them for co-op and HTTP um, to cover those uh, different use cases. So that text is there and some of it has been taken from um, at that time expired uh, key distribution, Bob key distribution document that we had in our working group. Um, additionally, 
Um, it turns out that the WebRTC guys, they have also defined the doc conformer. There was one sent for review to the list. Uh, so they have a, a binary encoding that is not CBOR. At that time, I think CBOR didn't, wasn't finalized. Um, or doesn't matter. So they have a separate pop doc conformer. Then, of course, OAuth allows different formats. So that's um, perfectly fine. And we did a review of that. And they use this with their Dun Stern firewall. Um, traversal technology. Um, great, uh, so more usage in this WebRTC real-time uh, communication on the web um, mechanism. And I provided a little bit more details of that work also in pointers in the link uh, you can see on the screen. In any case, um, what that means is that um, we are trying to, at least in two different groups outside OWASP, uh, trying to finish the Bob token work which uh, was in this in this working group a little bit underappreciated, at least with respect to that document. Uh, we have worked on other pop token solutions. Um, so it turns out I tried to update the documents with uh, the help of my uh, co-authors and get them in line with what the la latest status is. And it turns out that we ran into uh, three issues which I would like to get some guidance on from the working group to actually then execute those changes. I don't, didn't want to uh, surprise you all with uh, suddenly totally different documents. And the three issues, I believe, are maybe there are others. Uh, the HTTP-based parameters, which were previously in, in, in the OAuth uh, document, are now in the ACE document. Is that something uh, you guys uh, are comfortable with? Or where should they go? Should they go back into uh, the OAuth group? or? And I will talk a little bit more about this. Uh, the other one is um, there's this there's some misalignment between what's in the Bob token distribution document and what's in the ACE OWASP document. There are different um, um, parameters used, and and maybe one is better than the other, or maybe both are equally fine. Um, we'll talk about those things. And then finally, there's a there's a question about the encoding of the key transport. Um, and that's that those are the main issues I have and, and happy to hear others as well. Um, let me very briefly summarize in case you haven't read the ACE OAS document recently, the couple of parameters defined. And I mentioned the first one in previous <coughs> OAS working group meetings. There's one, the audience uh, parameter. And the, as the name indicates, and we had discussions and contributions and drafts in this working group uh, before. Um, this parameter is useful when you, um, for example, in the symmetric key solution, when you, when the client wants to tell the authorization server what the target of that communication is going to be, which resource server am I going to send this token finally to? Because the, re the authorization server needs to have that information in order to encrypt the symmetric key that goes into the, the CWD pop token. Otherwise, it doesn't know how to do that unless it uses some, some, other, uh, some other mechanism. So, but uh, that's where we use that parameter. Uh, the second parameter is this confirmation parameter, um, which is used to carry the keys from the authorization server to the, um, to the uh, client and also to provide some, par um, I think, parameters to the public key uh, fingerprint from the client to the authorizations, uh, to the authorizations, authorization server. There's also one other uh, parameter that um, you may not have seen before. This is called RS uh, underscore CNF. This parameter gives the client information about the raw public key to be used with the, by the uh, resource server. Okay. I'm not going to talk about this one any further, but um, just to let you know, there's a there's a, conf, a CNF and the RS underscore CNF in case it's confusing. Yes, a uh, chat question from Phil Hunt. I think the block in the OAuth working group is the final step, how to do message authentication. HTTP request signing seems impossible. Hannes, are there techniques from the other groups that could be applied more generally? Yes, so, um, so the other, so in the, um, in the ACE working group, the focus is obviously not on HTTP. Uh, so there are other IU protocols used in the IoT context where solutions have been worked out on how this request signing looks like. And, and, and 
uh, Ludwig, maybe you can elaborate on that. But um, uh, the mechanism that was defined for co-op is apparently also applicable to other protocols that uh, use a RESTful uh, paradigm, including HTTP. That's what uh, the presentation was about some IDFs ago when um, this topic was brought up on the mailing list. You may remember. I, I, I can post the link again to the presentation. Ludwig sites. Um, but there's also the in ACE the DTLS profile, which defines how to use these confirmation keys in the DTLS handshake in order to prove the possession of these keys. And I would guess that this is applicable for TLS as well. I mean, there was a draft in OAuth by Samuel and me recently saying how, how we did that. And there was not a lot of interest in it, so we dropped that. But basically, I, I assume that the stuff we do with DTLS is really, really easy to transfer to TLS. A uh, couple of observations. Uh, from the token binding work, making changes to the TLS stack and exposing the EKM and all of the other things that might be easier in other newer environments is really, really hard to impossible. <clears throat> so if, you know, it probably reusing token binding, which is already going through all the pain of exposing those additional parameters, maybe, you know, is a way of doing it. Uh, the other, the other, and we already have work going on on that. The other thing, um, uh, Brian uh, and I put out a draft on resource, uh, which replaced audience. We discovered that in practice, audience AUD is a parameter to the token endpoint is really, really problematic. So yes, we need the parameter. It's just don't call it audience. Uh -huh. that it causes all sorts of issues once you start sending a jot to authenticate, which has an audience, mm -hmm. which is it the audience of <clears throat> the resource server in the jot or the audience uh, that's supposed to be the, the, the token endpoint. It just, we need a different name. Mm -hmm. So you, you suggest to call it resource? Yeah, that's, that's what. Okay that but, proposal was um, mm -hmm. calling this audience will cause endless confusion. Okay. So yes, we need the parameter. That's just a really bad name as it turned out. And John, uh, so since that uh, parameter has been defined in the ACE working group, which is uh, defined for both HTTP as well as uh, co-op as a parameter, do you see that as a problem? Yeah. It would, we, basically, you can't generically use that because the parameter already exists for the token endpoint in no, some no, of the no, authentication I mean, methods for... No, no wrong. Uh, uh, or, sorry, at the authorization, no, well, I mean, at the token endpoint. Uh, different. Um, diff well, you know, if we're... No, if I, want to, I, I was after something different. Uh, do you see that if we change the name of the parameter to resource in the ACE OAuth specification, it would be applicable to both no. co-op and HTTP. Would that would you consider that as a problem? So this was actually not one of the issues I thought it would be an issue. But <laughs> uh, Brian uh, Campbell, I, I think that is potentially a problem because it's it has completely different semantics in in ACE, so, um, and, and there's only one registry, so I would, I would prefer that it doesn't get used up. Why, um, why is that a different semantic? If, I, if the client tells which the authorization, so which So uh, I, I haven't read it all, server. but it, it, when I read it, it was a CBOR encoded thing. But for, the, it's a CBOR encoded thing for the, for the uh, co-op, um, as a, for the co for when, it, when it's transported over co-op, but it's I don't remember what the what the encoding is for HTTP. So they're different different encodings for different protocols. It's, I may have read it wrong. It it read very much the parameter definition read to me like it was Cbor to the authorization server. Which we seems we changed that I, that's, uh, at some point through the um, lifetime of the document. So, but but the intention is to have or 
Okay. All so, of those parameters that the, I'm talking the, about, they are diff they are encoded differently depending on whether they go on HTTP versus they go on uh, on co-op. Okay, I, my mistake then. Mm. Apologies. So assuming we can sort that out, resource would be better than audience. Okay. Yes, if that was your question. No, the question. My question was: Do you see a problem if we define this in the ACE OAuth document for also for HTTP as well as co-op? Um, not. Again, it de probably depends on whether I mean, the, the problem with having it in co-op is that other things may, people may not find it, etc. As part of of OAuth, um, I'm not violently opposed to having it defined there, but that may confuse people and or cause it to be attempted to be reinvented any number of times. Um, it may be better to define it as a separate separate spec in in OAuth because we have a whole bunch of things in OAuth that are going to want to use that this isn't the only use case for that parameter so it's not unique to pop tokens no no it's uh, the, right. in the way how the parameters defined right. is is more generic it just right. says uh, you could it so, just says this it, is the resource i'm going to talk to so it, the the identifier that particular parameter probably deserves its own document so that it's easily referenceable from other other OAuth specs. Uh, burying it down in in a co-op document, maybe in an ACE OAuth document or ACE. Oh. Right. So I, I, we don't need to sort that out now, particularly. Well, actually, we, but we do. Okay. Uh, we really do because yeah. then, uh, then if we're sorting it out yeah. now, I would say. For the sake of clarity, let's put it, put that parameter in its own document because, again, it's it's been attempted to be defined at least three or four times. There there was a yeah. standalone document on it in the OAuth working group. Right, and that's actually the downside because we, as I mentioned earlier, the plan is to go to working group last call in September, uh, whereas this has been worked on in OAuth for whatever reason because of different objections, uh, like for years uh, and. It would be unfortunate if then there's this dependency uh, that where we stall things, uh, et cetera. Well, That's also if, something to take into account. Like, if the two people that objected to it last time aren't objecting to it now, then perhaps we could do this relatively quickly. Who, 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 who was the one? Oh, the meeting minute. And uh, Phil? I didn't. I didn't say his name. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, um, what do you think about this? <clears throat> Phil, do you have an opinion about this? Do you want to briefly speak about this topic? What What is your sense uh, now, a few years into that discussion? He may have gone back to his nap. No, he's awake. It's the middle of the day for him. <laughs> no, it's more early morning in Vancouver. Oh, that's where you... Yeah. Did you push the button? Well, yeah. Can you hear us? We can't hear you. Supposed to be speaking. Yeah, it says he's speaking, but... We can't hear you, Phil. Phil, you may need to unmute. Okay. Okay. He didn't object except for Simon. Oh, okay. Which is what? a separate issue. Which is a separate <laughs> issue. Yeah. Tony, you want to come to the mic? Tony Nadlin, I don't believe it's a separate issue. It could be an orthogonal issue, but I think we have to figure this out at the same time. I don't think you can agree to this and, and say signing, we're gonna, we're gonna totally forget about it this time. Well, we are talking about a specific spec for adding a mm -hmm. resource parameter to the token endpoint. We could ignore it and allow uh, ACE to define it for us. I'm sure that that would that you would see that as a preferred <laughs> yeah. option. I, th I think Tony, the question is uh, not whether we are going to define that parameter and register it. I think we are past that point. Uh, that decision has been made. The question is, which document will it go? 
and there are two choices. Uh, yeah, there's a separate OWASP document or there's the ACE OWASP document. Yeah, and I'd rather see it in the OWASP, separate OWASP document. Thank you, Tony. So um, I think that's a better choice. But I didn't understand John's point about um, token binding. Are you? Are you that was a separate. I know, <laughs> but it bothers me. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Many things bother you. Um, <laughs> The, the, the point is that if we're going to have a presentment mechanism that's going to start messing with the uh, TLS transport, mm -hmm. we already have a we presentment have, yes. mechanism. Okay. We should focus on that rather than trying to invent a new okay. but HTTP that, but that, that presentment decision mechanism. also has been made already. So, uh, well, first, no, we, no. Not in, in AC, you, you were just talking about, well, maybe... A, <clears throat> Maybe ACE ought to recon. If ACE is looking at doing a new presentment mechanism yeah. over HTTP, then perhaps yeah. they ought to look at no, no, using not, token binding rather it's, than, it's than not some using, new TLS bound yeah. mechanism. It's not. It's not. ACE is not defining a new presentment mechanism over HTTP. What it does is it uses the keys uh, as one of the possibilities. Uh, the keys in the DTLS handshake to protect co-op. OK. OK, so this is DTLS specific. <clears throat> it's, so. it's a, it's a, there's a document that talks right. about how to do so, that with DTLS and co-op. Right, so we ought not to worry about applying Jim, that to TLS you, because we already have a mechanism for that, is my point. Yeah, for HTTP. For, for uh, DTLS, that's, that's, that's fine. fine, yes. OK, so good. We, we resolved that issue that was. Uh, I, I would expect it to be perfectly. I, I would expect it to be used in uh, doing co op over TLS too. That's the same mechanism as DTLS. That's fine. Uh, or at least um, I would expect it to work as well. I mean, it's going to be this. It's for, for, from, from an API point of view, it, it, is, it is identical. Yeah. Um, some time ago, Brian Campbell wrote draft Campbell OAuth resource indicators. I was co author of it. And I think John was too. Yeah. <laughs> this already solves the problem. I fully agree. I with think you. that we should now adopt that as a working group document and finish it. So there, there may be some stuff that from the other co op um, <clears throat> ACE document around encoding for other transports that we want to pull into it, but yeah, that should be fairly quick work. Yeah, I mean, Brian's already done the heavy lifting. We should just use it. And I don't know when the chairs want to call that question, but um, it, there seems to be a lot of people in the room who, including yourself, who think that we need this parameter and it's already written down. Yeah, so maybe, um. We could also maybe you can get a sense yeah. of the room, but yeah, just for let, let, let the queue. Yeah, let, let's finish the queue. Uh, yeah. Jim Shah. Um, I I'm having a problem understanding John's position on the the using the name audience. Um, my understanding is that this is basically designed to be equivalent to the audience in a CWT or a JWT. But this is so a using a different right? name seems odd. I'm not saying use it as a different name in the access token. I'm saying that as a request parameter where it conflicts with the audience. So when you're talking, when you're making a request to the token endpoint, adding an extra parameter that says audience, which is actually the identifier for the resource server, that audience and the audience of your request conflict once you put them in a jot and send it as a. Right, so we don't, so we don't well, I'm, that is one so of the can I, can I can I try to clarify that because John's confused. Um, although he's sort of right, audience has been a little bit confusing. We've used AUD. John. We we've used AUD in our own implementation, and it's caused confusion with people. But the actual like conflict problem that John's talking about is related to the authorization request, where we have drafts that define a JWT encoded set of the parameters past the authorization request, and thus. And it also allows for the the audience then is a parameter value in the JWT. So there's a collision with the audience name. That I don't believe that's 
So well, that it's with it's respect to that initial authorization request and implicit tokens, I don't think it's applicable in the in the ACE world. Um so I wouldn't say that actually. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a good it's if there's some already defined parameters, I didn't realize that to it's, be honest. It's sort of defined implicitly defined by being a jot claim when the claims of the jot are used as the parameters of the request. It's it's a weird sort of that sounds indeed weird, um, but so I think it's perfectly fine that there's a there's a, a claim with the term audience because that goes from the authorization server all the way to the resource server, and that's exactly what we want. We essentially want the client to say, "I want to talk to example.com in an audience when it." parameter when it goes from client to authorization server the authorization server is supposed to then take that information actually dump it into the token and to pass it along this is a, this is exactly what we want I, yeah i understand the pattern yeah. um likely the well there's some there's some issues around actually the the client being able to know and convey what the the actual value of the audience in the resulting <laughs> token should be that's where some of the complexity comes up at least in in the work we've done um, but but the problem, the the actual technical conflicting problem is around the authorization server. When it when it says audience, that that audience has multiple meanings in some contexts. So that that's sort of the the root reason that you, you can't use audience, at least in the broader OAuth context, as a request parameter. But then there's no other uh, claim that there's one only one audience claim as as far as I know. Yeah. There shouldn't be any confusion so, whatsoever. So in, in Jot, the standard yeah. audience claim is defined. In, in, and that's the one we want to reuse. No. Well, we want to reuse that in the tokens that are issued. Yes. But there is a, a standard, two standards actually, to keep it interesting, okay. mm -hmm. about how to use a Jot to encode the request to the authorization endpoints. And within uh, that, okay. audience is part of the job you but it gets overloaded the, as a request parameter. Are you talking about the the, the jar or what uh oh. JWS sign yeah. or okay. uh, request? Okay, yeah. Um now, does I, that now I understand the issue. Does that mean it, we would have exactly the same problem with confirmation <laughs> since confirmation is a field which can go into a, a job? To the extent yes. it would be used on the authorization endpoint, yes. Hmm. Yes, is it that is essentially the answer? Mm -hmm. Actually, that mean that almost sounds like maybe there's a problem with the um, with the with that chant with this uh, RFC that we are going to pass along because it uh, it mm, well, uses stuff in a in a not appropriate way. What no. which which yeah. RFC yeah. are you yet to become to? RFC the chant? No, Jar uses it as defined in Jot. The problem is that we're inventing new parameters which are not those parameters and trying to call them the same name. The problem is in these new specs that are trying to overload the existing semantics. So this is the requested audience, not the audience of the token. So you just have to call it something else. This is not the, the confirmation method of this token. It is the requested confirmation for the token that you're going to issue me. We just have to have different names for them. Otherwise, yeah. we will create endless problems for ourselves. Ludwig Seitz. Now I'm really confused. <laughs> I want to tell the resource, uh, the authorization server to put a certain audience and a certain confirmation key and a certain scope in my token. How do I do that? I mean, guys, you must have defined that. Honestly. Just use a different name, Ludwig. Don't overload a JOT claim name. That's the problem because some of the requests are going to be put in JOTs and those claim names are already used in those JOTs. So don't call it CNF in your request. Don't call it AUD in your request. You could call it requested confirmation. You could call it requested audience. There would be no problem. Just don't use exactly the same string. Otherwise, you'll blow up signed requests. Yeah. Uh, do you guys currently actually have that problem in your specs today? Because I believe scope is something that you can put into a request and is in a JWT. Oops. No, it's not no. part of a JWT. It is. It is. Actually, <laughs> so it is. it's not defined as part of the, the 
that's JWT looking at, by default. Looking, so, but if it, you could you could create a problem with scope if you if you really worked so, on such it. Such the so, but, um, Yeah. Yeah, yeah, please. And, and I'm going to uh, cut the line after Ludwig. Is so, that the last one here? So, okay. Or, or no. Brian, are you in the line? Yeah, yeah after Brian. So, John Bradley, Yubico. The, the claims are in that are that are part of the jot are fine the problem is that if you want to add a new if you're sending a signed request in a, in a signed object either a jot or um um uh, a cwt because uh, they'll both have the same problem Dick, because please. they're both defined if you try and say put some uh, parameter of I want you to issue a token with these things as those claims in the token you issue me if you since both tokens can have both a confirmation method and and an audience and a issuer, et cetera, if you use the same parameter names, you only have one, it's gonna be a problem. The, um, oh, that's. <laughs> so we have this exact same problem when we're using JWTs for URI signing. And initially in the early drafts, we used the odd, for something very similar to what it looks like here, and it confused implementers. And uh, the solution was really simple. We moved it to a, a CDNI specific claim name that was specific to our particular purpose, and we could define it however we needed to with whatever words were useful. And it gave us the odd claim back, which we could use for actually identifying with whoever was supposed to uh, process the token. John, I cut the line. Sorry. Ludwig, uh, two quick things. First of all, I'm not opposed to rename stuff. I just want to know why, uh, because it's for me that is more confusing. Like if I have a parameter name that is telling the OAuth uh, authorization server to put another claim, a claim with another name into the token, that feels confusing to me. But okay, I'm not going to fight this. This is not a hill I'm going to die on. And uh, to make matters worse, we define a scope claim. So uh, we probably need to rename that as well, I guess. <laughs> we need a scope claim in the token. Brian Campbell again, uh, a, few, a few things. John, proxying John, I'm sorry, it's against the rules, but he, the, <laughs> the, the proof of possession stuff that we've done to date in OAuth, um, the, the drafts that are proceeding, um, mutual TLS and token binding, haven't run into this problem because the key material is implied by whatever's going on relative to that and mutual TLS is the client certificate, token binding is token binding. So there's none of these parameter conflicts. Um, it's just a point of observation. That's how the the, the current sort of proof of possession work is, is proceeding. Yeah. The, the, the name conflicting is actually a little bit more subtle than we've talked about only jot claims which are sort of meta information about the token versus like more contextual i don't even know what to call it subject or contextual information so audience and cnf could potentially be conflicting to the extent that that jot needs to be audienced to the to the resource or to the authorization server and might have a confirmation in it about how it's presented although there's no nothing currently defined for that there's no scope conflict because the way, just the way that scope is being used, that it, it, it doesn't have context in a jot of, like it, it has its own context in this presentation, so it works okay. Even though scope is used in both places, it's all right. Um, I didn't explain that well at all. No. It, uh -huh. It's a weird, subtle sort of overlap of when you overlay a, a jot onto the authorization request, claims that have context about the, the validity of that jot, audience expiration, confirmation potentially then override request parameters that might have the same name. So those are the ones you need to worry about. So, so uh, scope, scope doesn't have that problem. Yeah. So my conclusion from this discussion is that we have to check for the parameter names and potentially rename uh, the ones where there's a conflict. Uh, I think yeah. it's, uh, it's good to point that out. Uh, yeah, and it should be on the registry, which I think is yeah. coming soon because my, my, of some my registration issues. And my, just 
lastly, I wanted to point out, this will come up, like that, we got that I did have the resource indicators draft, okay. but much of that content, or at least the concepts have been rolled into the distributed OAuth uh, draft that Dick's gonna talk about here shortly, which which itself also tries to define a, a resource parameter. So we, we'll, we'll have one more place to talk about it. Yeah. But uh, I think that would also be confusing to reference the distributed OAs in, in just for that parameter. Like it's as confusing as referencing ACE OAs. I don't disagree. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, so I guess I, I get the feeling that most people um, kind of uh, in agreement that uh, we don't want to use that audience parameter and we want to call it some some something else is and do uh, i think maybe we, we need a hum on that because i see some nods uh, not clear about this maybe maybe there is still uh, people that are not clear on this one so i would ask for a hum for this and and maybe just to continue with this is that is that fair enough go ahead Maybe do a hum after I present and talk about the use of resource and distributed OAuth, and then people okay. can see that there's multiple places okay. that are needing it. That's fair enough. Mike? Are you going to do the hum to adopt draft Campbell resource indicators as a working group document? <laughs> that, that would be one of the uh, probably hums after that. But uh, I just want to make sure that people understand that there is a conflict and agree there is a conflict first, right? And that's my sense of that of the meat of the of the room that most people agree that that is the case. But uh, I want to just make sure that this is the case, right? Um, so maybe we okay. should wait for then uh, for yeah. Dick to to Pers present and after that take that that hum and I'm I'm fine with that. Okay. Okay. Good. Keep going. Um, so that took a little longer. That was supposed to be a click through. Um, okay, so profile, the profile topic. Um, so in ACE, uh, the profile has a, a specific meaning and it, just to uh, summarize in case you haven't read the document, so in, there are different protocols being used and security mechanisms between the client and the resource server because they are just different deployment uh, environments and in the way how this was approached in the ACE working group was to uh, register a, a profile string with a specification that defines exactly on what the mechanisms and what the procedures are. So for example, I listed one here, which is the DTLS uh, co-op underscore DTLS profile, which uh, as the name sort of indicates, it refers to a specific specification and that happens to use uh, co-op secured by DTLS. And it defines on how the keys um, that come out of the, or as, are associated with the Bob token are used in that, uh, to secure that exchange. Uh, that's what, uh, what is called uh, a profile. It turns out um, in the Bob key distribution document, we had a different parameter at that time, um, which was called the algorithm ALG parameter which allows the client to tell um, the authorization server what parameter it is going to use um, or planning to use or what it supports actually it, uh, on the uplink it's what it supports, what algorithm it supports um, for use with the resource server. Back then it was motivated by the work that Justin did on the HTTP signing uh, and, and it supported different algorithms. So uh, the authorization server was basically in charge of um, figuring out or knowing what the common, uh, what the resource server algorithm support is. And then it would tell, um, first of all, during the key generation, but also um, it would know what parameter to select. So it would basically make that uh, determination and it would send the corresponding parameter down to the client. That was the meaning at that time. And of course it was used with the token uh, in context of the token type, because if the token type indicated that uh, it was a bear token and that didn't make sense, uh, so it was if it's a pop token that that was applicable. Jim, Jim, Shad, um, I'm not sure that I actually see a conflict here. Um, if, for example, in the ACE world you were using a profile of um, OSCOR, 
Mm -hmm. uh, so if co-op also scores your profile, you may still want to be able to specify an alg to say which algorithm in Oscore you want to use. So mm -hmm. I don't know that there's necessarily a conflict in terms mm -hmm. of that. Okay. Those would actually be different parameters. Mm -hmm. Right now you couldn't specify the alg one, but that would make sense. Okay. So maybe maybe that's uh, maybe the solution is not either or, but both. Um, okay. Maybe that's a, uh, that's a solution. Mike was uh, um, objecting at least to the idea of the profile uh, parameter. So I, I tried to elaborate on what is actually needed to successfully establish um, the communication session between the client and the resource server. So first of all, there are a couple of different profile uh, protocols being uh, available, different ones used. There's um, the tokens come in different uh, flavors as well. So currently we have three standardized uh, token format are defined in the IETF, uh, um, most prominently the uh, CWT, uh, JWT, and then there's also for the WebRTC guy a DLB based encoding. Um, then there's different security protocols. Um, currently from the ACE uh, working group, there's a DTLS slash DLS. Um, there's also an, an application layer, OSCore uh, solution. Uh, there are different credential, credential types being used, um, which need to be somehow indicated. And, uh, and I talked about the, the algorithms and the parameters already. Uh, so there's quite a bit of information and um, that needs to be somehow uh, either available out of band or needs to be um, conveyed in the, in the protocol exchange to make, the, make all of this work. Um, depending on the security protocol you use, for example, uh, DTLS, that goes in here, um, DTLS can do a lot of negotiation on TLS uh, negotiation for you, so you don't need the authorization server to pass this information along. Um, for the profiles, uh, some of that information is fixed, so to speak, at the specification time rather than literally negotiated during runtime. But uh, deployments may have a, a different a different solution. So the question was, what's the story with the ALG and the profile? So um, is the profile, Mike, you, you had a strong view on this and, and I just heard uh, Jim's Yeah, just, just before, before Mike goes on, so five minutes, you'll be able to okay. ramp up, okay? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, profile is, in the OAuth world, typically something that is known by both parties via an out-of-band mechanism. I know of no deployed instances in which one OAuth client uh, uses two different OAuth profiles, which are selected at runtime. And the only purpose of sending this as a parameter is to select profiles at runtime. So I think that this is, you know, not even in the 10% case, this is in the beyond the 1% case, and you should delete the parameter. It is, it it is an optional parameter um, at the moment uh, in the in the ACE OWASP document. Yeah, but it's still encouraging people to think of something really complex as a normal thing to do. And I think it's a terrible thing to even attempt to do. I think it's encouraging complexity. Mm -hmm. So it should go. And, and uh, do you have a from both documents? Do you have a perspective on the a on the algorithm parameter as well? Would you also consider that out of band uh, information, or would you have a different? I would do that in discovery. I wouldn't s s necessarily send that. Um, but, the, but the discovery would be it would be a discovery of what the authorization server supports, rather than here we are discovering what the resource server uh, can use. Well, if you're sending the information in a JOT, you know the algorithm because it's in the JOT. But the client so the, the client, the client needs to know um, what algorithm to use for presentment in the context of the presentment. I mean, I, this doesn't bother me very much because okay. it is something that it, it might vary, unlike the profile, which will never yeah. vary. Yeah. Okay. Uh, John Bradley, Yubico, I largely agree with Mike. This is really a discovery and registration problem rather than a runtime decision problem. Um, okay. 
maybe algorithm at runtime, but it's, that also seems a bit unlikely to me. Um, really, we have to, I mean, we have this general problem of resource discovery and mm -hmm. allowing the client to magically know stuff and then tell it to the server. You know, we're just, you know, it's turtles all the way down. Unless we actually deal with how does the client figure out what it needs to do to talk to the resource server, either through the resource server or the authorization server? You know, you're you're not going to have any of these parameters to specify. Um, you know, the only the only time that that audience that alg kind of makes sense is if the client itself only supports a subset of algorithms, then and you might have the same client ID across multiple client instances that had different cryptographic libraries, but even that is a little bit tenuous. Okay, thank you. Okay, so <clears throat> I get get the feeling that, uh, um, like, uh, I guess th there is no consensus on, on, on those, on this, uh, I, I see. Um, Can you ask a question? Like yeah, yeah, I, I just wanna let Ludwig first. Ludwig Seitz, uh, well, just one comment. Uh, you're now discussing stuff that we're doing in ACE. I would have appreciated that feedback quite a while ago when we were defining these things. Excuse me, in October, I sent a review of the ACE OAuth spec explaining why profile was an encouragement of complexity and should be deleted because clients do not dynamically choose profiles at runtime and the review comment was ignored by the editors. So we did say this in the ACE mailing list. So, so let's um, uh, not, Yeah, you didn't do it. Yeah, let's not, uh, move, let's that's see ignored. how we, we move forward uh, in, a, in so, a good way. So uh, which which parameters are? Uh, is profile and I. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, I, I guess, Maybe uh, we'll take a hum here. Uh, for, first, do people, uh, I want to ask first if people understand the, the issue and, and if they have enough information about it, and, and, and then later hum on, on uh, one or, or the other. Um, so the first, the first one is just to ask if, if you have enough information or understand the issue, right? So if you have enough info, sorry. What's the issue? Oh, the parameters, those parameters were that, okay. The, re the so, removal or the, not. Okay. 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 It also depends on what document is, and what working group is proceeding in. And this is all irrelevant if we don't proceed with the, the top key distribution. We, we would proceed with it. There's no question. That's, that's, that's a question that another question. You know? No, that's not a question. So, so yeah, <laughs> it is. It is a working group item that is needed by uh, two other groups, and then there's a uh, dependency. We can of course shuffle content around. Uh, that's what we always what we can always do. But uh, it, you, it, it's. I don't think we are now getting rid of uh, a concept that is core in ACE and also needed with uh, web RTC. Or are you suggesting that, Brian, just because you, you don't like it? <laughs> just a nurture. I'm not going to speak for Brian. Um, but uh, having something be a working group item that is needed by lots of people all over the world has not been sufficient motivation for us to actually get anything done in the past. And I am uh, not convinced that it is still motivation. So I feel that your counter argument rings hollow given uh, the attitude of this group in the past towards similar and in fact, this exact set of problems. While I think we should probably, uh, you know, get our heads out from under the rocks and do this, I'm still not convinced that we are. And so I agree with Brian's statement that that is one of the open questions if we are going to do this or not. I don't think it's settled. So, so uh, just instead, yeah. so I'm trying to find out what you're actually trying to say is um, I hear you say that since the work is progressing in, in ACE, uh, maybe that work should altogether, that type of work, the pop key distribution work should actually be done there. 
I think that A should solve ACE's pop key distribution work. I think that OAuth should solve OAuth's pop key distribution work. And to the extent that we can, um, you know, abstract things and use common structures and common parameters and stuff, that's great. But the but problem is that the, but the problem is that we, when ACE was started, that uh, was that oh, use OAuth because we can reuse a common mechanism across the board uh, mm -hmm. and. Um, that's what we said. It wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, oh, we do OAuth here, and then you do Ace uh, there because it's a common. It uses a common technology. It's not a common technology though, because OAuth is very strictly defined to HTTP, and the Ace OAuth is doing OAuthy kind of things in a different stratum. It. I. I, I disagree with that as well. It was. Then you're wrong. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, that's your perspective. Yeah. I could point so, you to a book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to cut right. the line after uh, Brian. Sorry, man. And, uh, go ahead. It's Brian. I, I'm not even sure what to say, except that I think, it, to reiterate, that I don't think the issue is well understood. I, I, Which issue? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're saying the issue is not okay. right. so but not, say which issue. But that's my point. Uh, even what the issues are, it, there's okay. not a shared consensus amongst okay. the rooms. You, so, you must be choking. So, I, I no, no, explained no, no, no. to you. So, hold on, hold just on, guys. because you have slides doesn't mean everyone else yeah. sees it the same way. Yeah. There's, there's three questions that are open to advance the document. Uh, three questions. And the question are mostly about which document, which working group should work, put the content in a document. That's, that's the issue. How complicated is that? It's it's really complicated okay, because we'll, we'll we, find out. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we put stuff into the 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 ACE document, and but then we hear comments. Oh, this should be done in OAS, and then some other people come along and say, Oh, this we should work on this in OAS because there's no energy. Do it in ACE, huh? Yeah, so it's complicated. Okay, <laughs> I mean, so I don't know. Okay, guys, thank you. I, I don't think uh, we can take any harm today. I think we we need. Uh, more discussion and, and clarity on, on the issues before we take any harm. So that, that's my feeling here. And, so I, and that, that was exactly my worry that we essentially bounce back and forth between the two different groups. Uh, the area directors are unfortunately not here um, to raise their, yeah. uh, which I had actually asked them to do because so, it's ultimately a decision about the area directors on where they want, want to do the work. Uh, right. It's right. a pity. Uh, and but, and I, I would like, again, I think I, Cut the line, sorry guys. Uh, we we need to move on to to other topics because we are late already. Right? Uh, sorry, purely process. Um, Go ahead. I understand, and I can I can understand why you don't want to make a decision. Not making a decision makes a decision, for, as far as I'm concerned. So I think, or if in terms of of, of as, as being an ace chair, uh, my, my feeling is that there is confusion and, and not, uh, not enough clarity to make a decision in the first place. And that's the reason, okay? And that's the reason I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to take any, any action right now. Thanks, Hannes. Dick. Your... Well, hopefully this presentation will be a little less. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so we uh, presented a early draft of this in Singapore. Anybody at Singapore saw this? Yeah. Because I've got some things since Singapore. Um, Brian and Nat joined me as co-authors, incorporated you know, what we've been re talking about here, the resource indicator context into here, and uh, Nat had some stuff around metadata that we incorporated. So the resources, the URI in the earlier draft, it was just the host, um, added support for all, oh, that didn't constrain it to only be client credential grants, although it's unclear how the other ones would actually work yet or our use case for those, and then using the link header for discovery. Um, so one of the problems we're trying to solve is in a more distributed environment, the authorization server for a resource may not be known um, previously. And so it's discovered at runtime, which enables you to sort of change a resource 
you know, more of a dynamic configuration. Um, so you guys can just read that or I can read that. Does anyone have questions on this? What the problem is? Like here's a picture of it. And so here a client might be calling resources in, in really what are different geopolitical areas where they authorize, there are different authorization servers for each of those uh, regions, but the client wants to access resources in each of those regions and so needs to go to a different uh, authorization server. But that the, in this particular example, the scopes are potentially identical across all the regions. And so you're trying to have a signal for the scope that's different from where the resource is. One of the issues that comes up when you do this dynamically at runtime is uh, there's more challenges around access token reuse. So the, the client potentially could be using a token to go and access a resource that it wasn't supposed to. So for example, if you got a token that says you had certain scopes, but there's no enforcement as to whether it's say in China or the US, Right, you could that client potentially could access the same resource with the same scope in both places. And then another challenge, of course, is that the you know when you have a bunch of resources, one resource could be malicious and just reuse that access token to access other resources that that same client is accessing if if the tokens can be used different places. So there's two ways of solving that. And this document we work with the first one, which is audience restricting the access token but there's other models where you want to constrain the sender. So in the audience restricted, essentially you get a token for each resource and you use the right, you need it, the client needs to track which token is for which resource. And then the other examples where the parties are both a client and a resource server. So in this one, you want a sender constrained access token where there's the same access tokens used, but you want to know that whoever's calling you is the holder of that access token. So the bindings, the binding is more to the caller as opposed to the binding being to the resource. So an example of that, um, you know, they're NASA people, so they don't really make their stuff public, but there's a spec called UTM that all the people in this, the space thing are working on. So UTM is, you know, made up another acronym, UAS traffic management, UAS is unmanned aircraft system. So essentially for a traffic management system for drones to talk to each other and talk back to their base about um, where they're flying to. And in, in this example, the aviation authority such as the FAA would be the authorization server that says who are all the people that can be operating. They want to minimize what infrastructure they run. All the operators talk to each other to communicate and coordinate flight information. So each party can call any other party. And so you want to make sure that that, um, you know, the FAA has issued one access token to that party saying that they're authorized to participate. But, and then they each on each call, each party wants to prove that they're authorized by presenting that access token. Um, but you don't want one party to use somebody else's access token to call other ones. Um, that's a similar problem. Um, how that solved isn't covered in the current draft. And so one of the things I'm wondering is whether other people have similar use cases, whether it makes sense to put this in this, because it's, it's another example of distributed OAuth. So in the current draft, in the you call the resource is how the whole flow kicks off. You call the resource. And in the 401 response, you get uh, two additional things that are in a link header. One is the identifier of the resource, and the other one is where to go to get information about the authorization server to go and call the authorization server. There was some feedback uh, this morning on the list about these pieces, um, whether it's the full URI in OWASP server metadata URI, whether there's a better name for that. Um, I think actually just turning it down to the issuer makes more sense on that, I have some comments on that. So in this, the key thing, of course, is the client 
um, is able to know that the thing that it just called, that the, it, it matches that identifier for the resource, um, that the resource URI is part of the, the path that it called. And the identity of the resource is partly determined then by the TLS certificate in that call. Then the client goes and, you know, uh, from that, it knows where the AS is, and it knows what URI. And so, you know, here's our resource parameter in the access token re request that we were talking about before. So we're saying that you know the resource would be that URI. Um, if we were to take that out and have that be a separate document, I don't think we'd have an issue with that. That seems to make sense if it's useful other places. Uh, and so then in the access token, um, it includes the URI. If that access token happens to be a JWT, then it would be the uh, audience claim. And then when you call the resource server, you check that, um, that, that your resource URI is in um, your token. So here's the, sort of the discussion points. URI for the resource. Anybody? Any questions? Any feedback? Um, I'll make one observation for the server metadata URI. Um, while before the OAuth discovery spec, that would have made sense. Now we have. So we have two different formats for multi-tenant, um, one that's in OpenID Connect and one that's in OAuth because of path encroachment, et cetera. So doing, there isn't a single URI, there isn't a single base URI that you can use if it's a multi-tenant server. So we're probably best off just specifying the whole URI because now it's host name dot well known Ten slash tenant ID. So you'd have to actually have two different parameters to be able to fully specify a OAuth server on a multi-tenant host. So I think it's just more straightforward to use the entire URI rather than trying to explain that to people. But okay. other than that, that's fine. Uh, this is Hannes. Um, yeah. I also think yeah. it should be a URI. Just, at least, just, uh, just on that, the. Uh, one of the, the threats I saw was that the resource could essentially say any URI and send the um, client to fetch stuff from anywhere that may not be where the AS really wants people to fetch stuff from. That was the good thing about the OpenID Connect format. So it's it hard. It's hard I mean, because it was limited to the one path hop below the well-known. I, I mean, we, we, we would have to look at how you could constrain that or validate it with the, the OAuth discovery for, format for, for multi-tenant and, you know, it's, it would be, it's a, it's a real problem for Azure and some of the other, other multi-tenant hosting things. So something that we would have to address how okay. that would actually work. What you have, if we just did the base URI, it would break some of the multi-tenant people, large multi-tenant people now. Yeah, I mentioned my comment this is okay. earlier already on a URI, but uh, I, I also agree with Mike that um, defining this uh, parameter in a separate document would make much more sense uh, because there's a lot of uh, context with the distributed OWAS that uh, I think is not relevant or not applicable in other, in other environments. And, and then there's also the timing issue because this work has just started. Uh, and so so that's why I, I would prefer to have it uh, either in a separate or to just keep it in an AS OS document. You're talking about resources. Yes. You're yeah. talking about yeah. the yeah. resource parameter. Resource. Yeah. Mike, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong Mike. So if you think this is a different resource, again, from the previous discussion, but I'm referring to what Dick said because he wants, wanted to defer the call for uh, that uh, Rifat was supposed to make on the uh, audience slash resource um, parameter 
to later because Dick thought that this would be exactly the same and equally relevant. Is that, did I understood you correctly, Dick? That, that was what I was saying. John, maybe you can clarify why you think this is a different oh, resource. Well, this is, this is the, the link header coming back from the resource, not the resource parameter going to the authorization endpoint. You have- No, this is one we're talking about here. Okay, so, but that wasn't what the previous, was on the previous slide. So yes, the, the, this, the, this is what he's talking this about. This is what yeah. he's talking yeah. about. Yes. Right, but yes. that wasn't the that's why resource on the other That's side. Why well, no, well, because th this is the resource URI as it's handed in the access token request. Yeah. And so in the other slide, I had resource URI, which is the parameter called resource currently. Yeah. Okay. And everybody sits down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any feedback on using link header? Anyone opposed to that? It makes as much sense as anything else. Okay. So, so there was some comment on the mailing list yep. about you. So, do yep. you want to address I, that? I, 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 uh, I was hoping that Nat would respond. Matt's kind of listening in on the, the meeting, but I was hoping Nat would respond because he was the he had some good arguments for why link header. So you want to take it to the list, or do you sure? Want we'll to... take that to the list. Okay. Yeah, because I don't, I don't actually have a clear answer myself. Okay. And Matt doesn't know how to make XMPP work yet, so he can't type, but he's listening. <laughs> Hi, Nat. Um, another comment in the uh, list was supporting multiple resources in the access token request. Um, Torsten had sort of talked about that. I don't, I don't know. It's unclear to me a use case where that could happen. He described a use case, but it, but that doesn't really map into how the sort of distributed auth kicks off, which is that you call a resource and you get told where to go. So you're only dealing with one resource. I just want to say Nat's on, by the way, in case you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is he Wanted. typing anything that we can say? He will respond on list. But, okay. Great. So now we'll respond on list. Uh -huh. So I, I, I'm going to stick with the sort of previous position of we have refresh tokens. If you need, you know, multiple resources for a single access token, adds to the the complexity. Let's just if you need multiple, you have, if you have multiple resources, get multiple access tokens. There may be. Um, different keys or different transports or other things that you will eventually have for those resource servers. So yeah. trying trying to optimize it is probably counterproductive. All right. So anyone have a different opinion on that? Okay, well, we'll see whether Torsten can provide some crisp examples on the list. Is that Torsten? Uh, from Phil Hunt, oh. developers hate getting multiple tokens. <laughs> They hate security too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Developers hate doing what, what it is that they don't like doing. <laughs> Justin Richard, one repeating what John uh, said from the floor here is that developers hate security, which is marginally true. But what's more true is that most developers don't care about security, they care about functionality. And so uh, as you know, complex as we can make a security system, if it's too complex, they'll duct, duct tape it open in ways that we don't anticipate. I'm not saying that's what this is destined for specifically, but, um, <laughs> but it is definitely something we need to keep in mind, um, uh, especially because this is, I think, relevant to the larger resource URI um, discussion you look at what happens in SAML with audience and resource URLs and nobody knows which one means what, like ever. Um, so I think we have to remember uh, remember our history as we're choosing kind of what to call these and what they apply to. Okay, any suggestions on different names? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> okay. I, I, so Lucy Lynch, sort of a question and a puzzlement about multiple resources in an access token. 
given some of the current drift towards uh, delegation consent and revocation. Do you think about that in how, does that mean the entire token dies when one resource is revoked? When one scope is revoked? So, yes, yeah. so say, say one scope is, is withdrawn. Mm -hmm. Then? The entire token dies. The access token, yeah. Yeah. I mean. So it would have to be reissued with a, a, a more limited scope. Right. Okay. Yeah. Which, you know, typically happens if you don't, if a scope's revoked and you don't have, and you're using refresh tokens and the tokens are, you know, they're valid until they expire, then usually that would happen on the refresh. But, but then you'd get a new access token with the different scopes. I think I'm an imagining a world uh, post GDPR where you may be required to refresh quicker than you think you are. Yeah, and so implementations do that, then you know, do some bloom filter so that everything can check to see whether that's a uh, revoked access token, which forces the client to go back and refresh again right away. All right, so uh, to, to Lucy's point, you know, we designed refresh tokens so that we could have short-lived access tokens to deal with some of these issues, you know, allowing, you know, we don't want to encourage people to have long-lived access tokens that are good for multiple resources and start getting ourselves into these, these issues. So it's, you know, encouraging people to properly use refresh tokens, uh, keeping that, keeping that and adding a whole bunch of gubbings for, um, multiple um, resources just adds to the complexity. Yes, developers have to do a little bit more, but there are SDKs that take care of getting new, uh, exchanging, um, getting new access tokens off of a refresh token. It's not the end of the world for developers. Yeah. They have to deal with multiples. Well, if the developers dealing with multiple resources that have different authorization servers, they inherently have to have different access tokens anyway. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This this is sort of only an optimization if the authorization server happens to be authoritative for multiple resources. Yeah. Um, so my last question is, you know, the the proof of possession stuff is really between the client and the resource. Um, one of the challenges in a uh, distributed OAuth is the authorization server reusing the client credentials at a different authorization server and impersonating the client. Um, and so that sort of drives you to wanting to have a uh, authentication mechanism between the client and the AS that doesn't allow the AS to impersonate the client. If the client is using the same credentials at different ASs. Right. Ludwig Seitz. Yes. Why not use an asymmetric pop key then? You just give the authorization server your public key and you do the proof of possession with the private key and then the authorization server can't impersonate you everywhere else because yeah. it only has the... Right, but it's not, this is protecting the call to the AS, not the call to the so, resource. So we do have two current... Yeah. Uh, asymmetric authentication methods to the token endpoint, JWT assertion, well, then there's a SAML assertion, but we won't talk about that, and mutual TLS. Um, ideally, you know, you shouldn't be using symmetric credentials in a distributed system like this. That's just going to go wrong. So, yes, pro, I, you know, that's something that I've been fighting the GSMA and other people with large distributed networks. You know, just, you have to bite the bullet, use asymmetric client credentials and either use JWT assertion or mutual TLS to authenticate the client. Everything yeah. else will inevitably go wrong in some horrible way. Yeah. Actually, um, okay. The, the chat in, so I'm going to cut okay. the mic after. <laughs> Just before Hans. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think I, if I remember correctly in some configuration, even the JWT, um, sort of assertion profile wouldn't help because you you have to, uh, because it was more used as a bearer token. And so you could actually take that one AS could just take it and relay it 
to another one. Uh, so there's there's an audience. The audience would be the AS. So the yeah. AS couldn't. They, they could call themselves, we, but they couldn't call a different AS. We thought of that. Let's check that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there is another point which is sort of in the code flow. The U U resource URI could be a useful piece. That seems to make sense. Although I'm still trying, unclear of any clear use cases on the code flow. Um, whether we wanted to do uh, center constrained access token, and then of course this is still a uh, ID, and is this work that's interesting for the working group, and whether we should adopt this. That's a question to the chairs. Okay. To see if they want to put that as a question. Yeah. So, so I guess we have two questions. Uh, um, the the first one is about uh, the resource, uh, uh, the audience uh, question, and I think the last question is the most important question. Sure. Because if the last question <laughs> doesn't have the right answer, then the other ones are irrelevant. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, okay, so I'm gonna uh, call them for a quick adoption for this uh, this uh, document and see if there is enough support here. So if you are in favor of adopting this document as a work group document, hum now. If you're against, hum now. Okay, uh, I think that's clear. Okay. And just for completeness, there was one hum in favor on Jabber. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, so then quickly back to, can you go back to that to that slide that talks about the, the URI? One Which more? One? No, no, more, more, more. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, that's it. Um, so I, I think, uh, the, the feeling got fr from the room that they are uh, they don't want uh, to overload that uh, audience. So I want to um, ask uh, for adoption of that document that defines the resource um, server uh, or the resource uh, as a separate or as a parameter uh, versus uh, overloading that um, uh, the uh, the audience. So if you're go ahead, John. I think those are slightly two different questions. One is whether or not we should be using audience or resource as a parameter. The other question is, should we adopt the other spec and back out some of the stuff that went from that spec into this spec so that this spec refers to the, the resource spec? Yeah. The, the name and, and where the work is done are sort of two different questions. Right. Okay. Should we have a document that defines a parameter? A separate, do a separate document. A separate right? document, yeah. document yeah. to define a parameter for yep. passing okay. what someone would like to be in the audience of an issued token. Yes. Which I think Brian's draft was is a starting point right. for that. Uh, very quick comment. What you have here in resource and what I see in the Campbell drafts is different from what is in audience. It's like in the resource and in the Campbell draft, it's like URIs or URLs even. And in audience, it's more generic. So please align if you do that. If you do, go ahead with that. Yeah, there's, there's if we do a separate spec, we're gonna have to look at what right. ACE has done and, and other people to make sure that for the different transports, the 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 value of the resource parameter actually makes sense for those transports, but that can be done in, in that spec. Yeah. Stefan Sanderson, uh, I was just looking through the, the draft and I was just wondering, this is, you have multiple resources requiring different access uh, servers. Um, could you could you have multiple choices of how to for one resource server have multiple choices of where you go? Yes, and you could. Which authorization server? I think that's what you're referring to. Yes. Sorry, wrong yes. terminology. Authorization yes. service. Yes. 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 Which would give you resiliency, William? Yeah, just hey. just um, yeah. So just on the resource topic, I guess I've heard a few different use cases for that parameter over the years. 
And I'm kind of wondering if all these people consider themselves to be in distributed OAuth. I think that's actually probably highly likely. So it kind of makes sense to me to, to do that work here. But I, I know like Torsten and there's a few other people that were also interested in the, in the resource. Mm -hmm. okay. So why don't we do a... Yeah. Seconds. Leave the data separate. Okay. Have a document that finds okay. a parameter <laughs> to signal what should be the audience, right? Okay. So the question is, do we need a separate document to define that parameter? I think the question would be, should we adopt Brian's document? But but Brian's document is just a, and the, the manifestation of that, right? So is it specifically you want to talk about that? that Right. It should be. Should we adopt Brian's document as a working group document and do this work in that document? Right. Yes. So that it's okay. concrete. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's clear. Sure. About it. Okay. Fair enough. So uh, then I'll ask about uh, the adoption of um, resource indicator document, and um, okay. So if bro, uh, Dan. No. So, yeah. So, no. 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 So. Let's... So. We are already over time, so we yeah, need to yeah. So if, if you are in favor of adopting resource indicator document as a worker document, please hum now. If you are against, please hum now. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, we have so five we, minutes here. I, no, I don't think we have any more minutes. You guys. Yeah, we only have an hour. So if you cut, if, if you stop at five, like we have fifty-five minutes. So we're yeah, we are, yeah, we almost. So maybe we could summarize what we. <laughs> sure. So I I so, just sent a mail. Uh, you may have not have seen it uh, to the list about asking our area directors for a little bit of guidance on the the ACE, the synchronization between ACE and OAS. I think that will be helpful. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so let's like, let's give him uh, two minutes here. Okay. Oh yeah. Go for it. Okay, I'm going to be quick. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the security yeah. best practices document. Okay. This is going to do something. Okay. Uh, what is it? Uh, you should already have been paying attention to this. Uh, it's an overview of the security topics, dealing with all the feedback that we've gotten from the security researchers. We've divided based on the feedback. We've divided it up. Uh, reorganized the work so we've got upfront uh, recommendations and then the detailed threat analysis and proposed countermeasures. Uh, our recommendations are exact redirect URI matching, uh, avoiding um, <coughs> open redirectors through various mechanisms, uh, one-time uh, parameters, uh, tokens or, or values in the state parameter or uh, cross-site request forgery. Uh, AS specific redirect URIs, clients using Pixie to prevent the re-injection of code, um, using TLS based methods for constraining the representment of access tokens and end to end TLS wherever possible. Um, our current status, uh, we got some review feedback after 101. Uh, we've incorporated that into the latest version. Uh, we haven't had any um, Torsten's comment is reasonable feedback. <laughs> Perhaps we got some unreasonable feedback. <laughs> we'll have to ask Torsten what he meant by that. Uh, we have two proposals uh, which we have to decide what we're going to deal with. Uh, one about audience restriction, uh, which uh, we should probably add. I think that makes sense. Uh, crypto agility. Um, people can look at the proposal on the on the on the mail archive and decide whether or not we want to do something with that. Um, my personal preference is that probably doesn't, doesn't make immediate sense in the document. Um, so uh, we should decide uh, what we do with these two things and then do a last call and try and move this BCP forward. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Um, did Thank you. everyone sign the blue sheet? Okay. Lucy, you did. Thank you all. We're done. <clears throat>
had an extra minute, I could have dragged it out. <laughs> I have a minute to set up. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I need that minute to set up.